Hello friends, welcome to the another uh, segment of uh, polymer testing. In this uh, particular segment, we are going to discuss about the conditioning, mass, density, dimensional analysis and rheological properties. Now, uh, before we go into the detail, uh, here is a brief outlook that what we discussed in the, the previous segment. We discussed about the standardization. We discussed about uh, different aspects of the sample preparation, like sample preparation by direct shaping, sample preparation by indirect shaping, all these things we have covered. In this particular segment, we are going to discuss about the conditioning, the importance of conditioning. Then we will discuss about the various separators used for the conditioning, like air conditioners, enclosures, hygrometers, thermometers, then bulk material pro uh, properties, we are going to discuss about the mass density, measurement. Then we will have a discussion about the rheological properties. Now let us talk about the conditioning, the moisture content of the specimen, this must also be guaranteed in order to ensure uh, the repeatability of the test finding because sometimes the reproducibility of data is quite essential. So in addition to this uh, stipulated production of a specimen, an adequate homogeneity of uh, the test climate is quite essential. Now this may be because of the fact that polymers even slight fluctuation in loading rate and other test circumstances like ambient temperature or humidity, this may cause the characteristic value level to alter. So therefore, anybody will not opt for this one. That is why as a result, the testing conditions have been defined as so called standard atmosphere and they satisfy the average climatic parameter and so simulate real world situation. So you need to carry out the testing under the specified condition and then you can either simulate to whatever but like if we are having the atmospheric temperature say or room temperature or standard temperature say 25 degrees Celsius and if we need to work at say 50 degrees Celsius then we need to simulate the things as per the requirement. So for standardization specimen and conducting tests to characterize the material properties at room temperature, an environment that must adhere to the various standards. One of the popular standard in this aspect is ISO 291. Now the atmosphere is usually designated as the air temperature of say 23 to 25 degrees Celsius as per the standard prefers. Now these standard specifies the two different classes of a standard atmosphere, each of which correspond to the different range of deviation. Now class 1, this the limit temperature deviation to say plus minus 1 degree Celsius and a relative atmospheric humidity or RH factor to the plus minus 5 percent. The class 2, this limits the temperature deviation to say plus minus 2 degree Celsius and RH deviation is to plus minus 10 percent. So the adjustment of the specimen to the appropriate test is uh, climate is frequently sufficient to obtain the distinctive data on the polymer in short term test. The specimen they are trained for this particular goal to bring them into the balance with the typical atmosphere and the test duration this varies on beginning temperature and the geometrical characteristics particularly the thickness while during the condition the specimen assumed to be under the edges of ambient air temperature. Uh, the specimens moisture content and the moisture content of the surrounding air, they are brought to an equilibrium. This depends on the polymer's coefficient of diffusion. And the type of polymer being tested will largely decide how long storage will last. And the storage time can differ significantly for the some same type of relative humidity. Now these specimen must kept in a normalized atmosphere so that um, as much as of their surface is visible which is usually exposed to the action of the atmosphere. Now maintaining a steady storage temperature is typically not a problem but achieving the required humidity level is more and more difficult. Therefore, uh, desiccator or environment chamber, they must be used as a precondition. Now, in this particular table, we are having the relative humidity 
ओवर सेचुरेटेड साल्ट सोल्यूशन एट वेरियस टेम्परेचर लाइक पोटेशियम साल्ट वी आर यूजिंग द पोटेशियम हाइड्रोक्साइड लिथियम क्लोराइड मैग्नीशियम क्लोराइड सोडियम बाई कार्बोनेट एल्यूमिनियम नाइट्रेट अमोनियम नाइट्रेट पोटेशियम क्लोराइड ऑल दीज थिंग्स एंड द रिलेटिव ह्यूमिडिटी इन परसेंट इज गिवेन एट फाइव डिग्री सेल्सियस टेन डिग्री सेल्सियस फिफ्टीन डिग्री सेल्सियस ट्वेंटी डिग्री सेल्सियस ट्वेंटी फाइव से अप टू सिक्सटी डिग्री सेल्सियस एंड यू सी द वेरिएशन इन दीज रिलेटिव ह्यूमिडिटी कंडीशन नाउ द टेस्टिंग फैसिलिटी एंड समटाइम्स दिस टेस्टिंग फैसिलिटी मस्ट हैव द इन्वायरमेंटल चैम्बर्स सो दीज टेस्टिंग फैसिलिटीज मस्ट हैव an adjacent temperature chamber or the test equipment this must fit entirely inside the temperature apparatus now if polymer are to be characterized at a temperature they different from the reference temperature so one is the reference temperature and other is the characterization temperature so all these thing must fit in that particular chamber so in order to achieve a suitably constant cross sectional temperature specimen to be studied and it must be preheated at the at each tested temperature so that the thermal shock can be avoided <coughs> now specimens need to be stored in a method that avoids direct surface contact in order to get enough air circulation for uh, multi purpose specimen with a thickness of say 4 mm around 30 minutes it is quite adequate the time duration of 30 minutes is quite adequate and environment chamber this must be utilized if in addition to the changing the temperature a specific humidity level must also be maintained like to determine a media resistance of a polymer in a detergent container up to say 2000 hour specimens are exposed to the media may be oil water detergent solution all those things at a different temperatures so the value levels are then compared with the initial state now see by this way you can also find out the degradation and sometimes because of the variety of uh, the atmosphere these may be exposed to the the various conditions uh, may be uh, atmospheric temperature may be ranging from say 25 degree celsius to say 47 degree celsius or even from 2 degree celsius to say 47 48 degree celsius now in these long term experiments the strict separation of polymer type during the storage in recirculating heating cabinet and the media chamber is quite essential to get rid of reciprocally interacting Im impacts like uh, aging related breakdown products now let's talk about uh, the apparatus for conditioning one prima facie requirement or primary requirement is the air conditioned room now the test laboratory needs to have adequate air conditioning because uh, the polymer test technique they call for the test to be conducted under the reasonably tight temperature control so the air conditioning chamber must have uh, a proper temperature maintenance plus relative humidity or moisture content now tolerant level they must be maintained over the course of the entire segment or even the weekend or at a night where there is no lab staff available so this requires the reliable automatic control now when considering the installation of air conditioning a heating system should be taken into account because design must provide the best possible temperature uniformity throughout the working space now this is again with the respect to the two fold one is that if we are taking the data from say 2 degree celsius which is common in some some part of the world to say 45 46 degree celsius so in that case if you need to normalize the temperature of the chamber then you need to provide the heating so that it can go up to say 25 degree celsius or whatever the temperature is desired so that's why the heating uh, should be uh, taken into account now when room is uh, uh, with the controlled humidity and a temperature is needed it's best to place inside another room with the fewest possible windows and doors so that the uh, the atmospheric contamination can be avoided let's talk about the enclosures the cabinet with the regulated humidity and uh, temperature they are frequently used for conditioning and moisture aging studies the two most common forms of humidity control cabinets are moisture injection cabinet and salt tray cabinets 
the most straightforward form of uh, these cabinets where the saturated salt or standard solution maintain um, uh, the proper humidity in the test environment at a specified control temperature. Now, because these salts are hygroscopic in nature, so by this way, if you are putting in uh, over a tray, you can uh, you can have a constant moisture content of this ambient air. Now, if uh, humidity in particular has to be maintained within the necessary tolerance throughout the working area, the design of these cabinet is very crucial. The depth of the salt, the size of the, the tray, all these things are very crucial. Now, uh, the ISO standards, they provide some of uh, the dimensions and some helpful information for the use of such cabinets um, for all the polymeric materials. Here, we, uh, we have showed a photograph for the enclosure of humidity and temperature maintenance. A suitable moisture sensors must be employed like capacitive uh, sensors uh, or a wet or a dry, dry bulb hygrometers. These measures the humidity and controls that how much moisture is injected into the chamber. Let us talk about the hygrometers. So, while wet uh, and a dry bulb thermometers or a capacitance impedance uh, instruments are typically utilized for everyday use in equipment and enclosure, the dew point hygrometers are typically employed as reference standard for measuring relative humidity. Now, platinum resistant thermometers, they are uh, recommended for the, 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 this particular purpose due to their extreme stability and durability. And uh, sometimes they, re they required a, around the 3 meter per second air flow in order to perform the accuracy so that the proper circulation must be maintained. Now, this is uh, the typical photograph of uh, the hygrometer. These uh, hygrometer, standard hygrometer tables are provided by various standards uh, for the use uh, and wet and dry bulb and uh, the BS48, uh, British standard 48. 33 ISO 4677 this can be used for these hygrometric table using the aspirated um, and whirling psychometers. There are some psychrometric, uh, psychrometric charts, all these things are available for the ready reference uh, for, uh, for uh, collecting, collecting the data. Let us talk about the thermometers. While electronic version of the various temperature measuring devices are quite popular, the traditional mercury in glass or alcohol in glass thermometers are still commonly utilized. And the most popular sensing component for electronic thermometers are thermocouples or platinum resistance thermometers. Now, uh, some of uh, them are robust and uh, linear but less stable than other one like um, and the temperature range they can cover is less as a very large uh, temperature ranges can be attained by altering the metal combination in the thermocouple. Now, here you see that uh, these this type of uh, digital thermometers are becoming more and more popular nowadays and uh, uh, there are certain ASTM manuals uh, and ISO manuals they are available how to use these thermocouple and the uh, various sections of uh, British standards. They also provide the guidelines for the selection and uses of these thermometers of various sorts. Let us talk about the bulk material properties. Now, how pelletized or a powder molding materials they are handled and transported depends on the various kind of characteristics of the bulk material. Now, to characterize and forecast the behavior of such qualities throughout processing to build feeding apparatus uh, and uh, to set up the cavities in the mold used in the polymer processing, these properties must be ascertained. Porability, the bulk density, these are the two criteria that must be present uh, to characterize bulk attributes. And uh, different type of parameters can be used to provide the precise characterization. One is the bulk material density, then bulk material strength, then internal angle of friction and wall friction angle. Let us talk about the bulk density. Uh, bulk density is usually determined by the mass to volume ratio of a heap of bulk material under the specific circumstances like rho Sg is equal to msg over V. And uh, this kind, uh, this is uh, the typical apparatus for determining the bulk density as per the ISO 60 standard. Now, in this kind of equipment, a predetermined volume um, uh, of molding material passes through a hopper with a particular geometry. 
here this is this this is the hopper bottom uh, shutter this is the measuring cup and uh, all these things are a screw and a tripod now the loosely packed bulk material is then fall into the measuring vessel that is positioned underneath it and it when the hopper bottom shutter is open. So, rho Sg can be represented as M1 minus M0 over V, where M0 is the mass of empty vessel and M1 is the mass of vessel filled with the bulk material and V is the vessel volume. So, the bulk density, this also takes into account the geometric shape in addition to gross density. And bulk density for molding material with the long fiber and slices is calculated as per the ISO standard 61. Let us talk about the fill factor and sometimes referred as F. The fill factor F, this describes the relationship between um, the volume of the piled or compacted material with the volume and sometimes referred as a VSG and uh, mm, uh, the volume of the compact molding material after processing and sometimes referred as a VFS. So, F that is the fill factor is equal to VSG over VFS and that is equal to rho FS over rho SG. Now, designing storage, transport and the feeding equipment requires an understanding of the molding material parameters like bulk density, compacted apparent density or fill factor, whether in pallet or a powder form. Now, because bulk density is a pressure propagation component in bulk material, this is the determining factor for pressure buildup in the solid conveying portion of extruder or injection molding machines. Now, let us talk about the pourability angle of uh, uh, repose and slide angle. Now, since uh, they must uh, be transported uh, through the hopper, container and a pipeline of the polymer processing equipment and the facilities, bulk material are distinguished by their pourability. The granulometric metric uh, and viscos viscoelastic properties of the polymer are both important for understanding the rheological behavior of uh, bulk polymer materials. The surface moisture electrostatic interaction between the bulk material or particle particles and the vessel wall, this can have a negative impact on pourability. Now, here you see that this, this is the apparatus for determining the pourability of polymer bulk material as per the ISO standard 6186. So, here you are having a delivery hole, the nozzle, nozzle holder, then is screwed and all these things are polished and they, we are having a specific angles. So, it makes sense to distinguish between the cohesive free flowing and non-cohesive bulk material for that particular reason. So, that is why the polishing has been done at the inner core of uh, that particular apparatus. So, as per this standard, the pourability or pelletized polymer is determined. Now, the angle of repose, the pourability of molding material in pellet and powder form is characterized by the angle of repose. The slope in which uh, the pelletized mat molding material starts to slide off a surface with a specific surface quality is identified in order to establish the angle of repose. The angle of repose which is usually influenced by a surface moisture or a liquid absor absorption to the pellet surface is dictated by density and aeration forces between particles in addition to the geometric form of uh, pellets uh, or powders. The calculation of hopper slopes uh, in feeding machine for instant use uh, of angle of repose. Let us talk about the mass and dimension. The density, mass and the size all play a very significant role uh, in how much a product costs. So, checking the dimensional accuracy of a component is one of the simplest quality control methods and the mass is a crucial factor in determining how much of an ingredient to use and an optimization for the optimization of all the recipe, this particular information is quite significant. Apart from this, it should be noted that the weight tends to be utilized indiscriminately and the mass is frequently used to produce a force in test techniques. 
Usually the daily measurement, they have a tendency to be taken for granted and this may definitely happen when measuring dimensions leading to unneeded errors. Let's talk about the mass measurement. The test piece or object in issue is weighted using a proper balance or a scale to determine its mass. The weighing device, this must be chosen in accordance with the requirement for magnitude and accuracy. So, while balances, they may be characterized uh, uh, as per the graduation, sometimes it may be 1 milligram accuracy, this requirement are frequently stated as accurate to 1 milligram. Now, standards are always, uh, I mean, you can say they are not clear and two are not the same. Dimension measurements, a tensile dumbbell thickness and the width data, they are used directly in the stress calculation. Any measurement error or uncertainty, this translates immediately into the measurement error or uncertainty in the test result. It is convenient to divide these test component dimensions into large and small categories. Then large indicates that a rule or a tape there is an appropriate measuring tool and the micrometer, dial gauge and calipers, they are considered as minuscule. Additional categories for small measurements, this includes the contact method like dial gauge and non-contact methods like traveling microscopes. Uh, while when we use the non-touch methods, they, they are provided for a specific situation. The contact methods are more frequently used for the test measurement. There are non-linear measurements such uh, angles as well as the field of surface roughness, dispersion, extensometer, thermal expansion and there are many more. Uh, now let us talk about the standard laboratory procedures or protocols. This has the four procedure for measurement uh, for dimensions less than 30 mm, 30 to 100 mm, over 100 mm and non-context. So over 100 mm a tape or a rule is employed with a maximum 1 mm inaccuracy and the caliper must be used with the maximum inaccuracy of 1 percent and without stressing the test piece for measurement between 30 to 100 mm. A dial gauge or equivalent with an inaccuracy of not more than say 1 percent or 0 0.01 mm is used for measurement under 30 mm. So, when we talk about 30 to 100 mm, there is a use of a caliper and for, for soft material, it is not ideal and required considerable care and using caliper on a stiff plastic is risk free since there is no risk of stretching the test piece. The dumbbell width is uh, obtained and uh, from the die dimension in part because the caliper are not ideal for thin sections. So, if we talk about uh, under 30 mm, there is a use of a dial gauge. Uh, on soft material, foot pressure must be taken into account and as per the ISO 4648, the recommended method is to administer 20 plus minus 5 kilopascal through a circular foot that is smaller than the test piece. Now, uh, now sometimes the below 35 IHRD, 10 plus minus 2 kilopascal is utilized for very soft materials and the dial gauge measurement of a soft material and a stiff substance to show the potential variation from true thickness. Let us talk about the non-contact method. The non-contact method which makes use of uh, moving or projecting microscope is design, designed for use with the unique form including o-rings, coating thickness dimensional stability, dumbbell cutter profile, impact notches and rip nicks. For measuring small dimensions to stiff material, a micrometer is utilized. Sometimes the accuracy requirement for the micrometer and sliding caliper are 0 0.05 mm for dimensions under 10 mm and 0.1 mm for the dimension over 10 mm. The traveling microscope usually is fine but tedious in operation. It may be sole practical approach for measuring changes in the lateral dimension between the marked spots on a surface during the dimensional stability testing. And the accuracy must that be that the thickness of marked lines is the limiting factor. The contact method due to 
affordability, speed and ease of the dial gauge, digital microscope, etc. The contact methods are employed for the majority of uh, uh, test item dimension measurement. Extensometry, this extensometer the, uh, re, is a, a, a scientific technique used to measure the change in the length or strain of an object under the application of stress or force. Here, this is a typical photograph of extensometer. Now, it is commonly employed in the material testing, engineering and research field to assess the mechanical properties and behavior of material. Now, this device is used in, in extensometry is called the extensometer which typically consists of a measuring frame or arms uh, that attach to the specimen being tested. The extensometer is designed to accurately measure the elongation or contraction of the specimen as it is subjected to tension, compression or bending forces. Now, there are uh, various type of extensometer available depending on the specific application and the desired measurement accuracy like mechanical extensometer. These extensometers use mechanical mechanism to measure the displacement of the specimen and they often employ a gauge or a reference marks that move as the specimen deforms and allowing the uh, for the measurement of strain. Then electrical resistance strain gauge, these extensiometer utilize the strain gauge made of fine wire or file that change their electrical resistance when subjected to strain. And the change in the resistance is measured and correlated to the deformation of the specimen. Then laser extensiometer, the laser based extensiometer use uh, laser beams to measure the displacement of uh, the specimen and the laser is directed onto the specimen surface and the reflected beam is captured by a detector. So, the changes in the reflected beam provide the information about the deformation, how much it is deformed. Then optical extensometer, the optical extensometer, this utilize the optical principle like interferometry or image analysis to measure the deformation and they can provide the highly accurate measurements and are commonly used in research and precision engineering application. Let us talk about the rheological properties. Uh, this, uh, these, uh, the discussion is uh, purely restricted to the polymer segment and the rheological fundamentals like uh, sometimes we may encounter the various uh, terms like uh, viscosity of Newtonian and non-Newtonian flu fluids. So, the flow be uh, flowability or the flow behavior of fluid is characterized by the viscosity and that describes the internal resistance of the fluid to an externally acting load. And the corresponding to the type of a loading, we distinguish between the shear and elongational viscosity. Now, just have a brief look at why this rheological property is essential because sometimes in the polymeric system, we need to heat the, the uh, polymer sample. In that case, all chains, they are unentangled and they intend to flow. And whenever we go for any kind of a processing thing like uh, any kind of a molding, injection molding or a compression molding or any kind of extrusion, all these things, then all the rheological properties or the viscosity behavior need to be addressed and they need to be studied. Because sometimes if the temperature is higher or some sort of solvent is higher in that case, it may not possess the desired flow pro uh, properties so that it cannot be processed. So, this type of information is quite essential. Let us talk about the shear viscosity. The absolute shear viscosity can be defined as a tau y x over is equal to f over a naught is equal to neta d v x over d y is equal to neta y x. There tau x is the resulting shear stress when a plate with the surface area a is moved at a velocity nu over a, a, a fluid lying on a fixed plate because see this is the uh, some sort of stationary phase and then all these things they are moving in such a direction. So, and then this is again very stationary phase. So, dvx over dy is equal to gamma x and tau y x are directly proportional to the neta that is the Newtonian viscosity. Now, Newtonian fluids, the water solvent, mineral oils, and thin polymer solutions, they are among the fluids whose viscosity does not change when the shear rate does. And Newtonian behavior in the polymer melt typically, uh, typically only appears at a very low shear rates. And non-Newtonian fluids, the shear stress and the shear rate, they are not directly related since viscosity is no longer constant. Uh, 
and the flow is non newtonian in actual processing technique like extrusion or injection molding where the relatively large shear rate happened in highly viscous melt uh, then let's talk about the different models like oswald and dewell model they are also known as a power law model or flow behavior index model uh, it is uh, the mathematical model frequently used to describe the flow behavior of non newtonian fluids particularly those exhibiting the shear thinning behavior and oswald dewall model relates the shear stress tau to the shear rate uh, new uh, in a fluid using the following equation this particular equation can be used where tau is the shear stress gamma is the shear rate k is the consistency coefficient and nita is the flow behavior index so the flow behavior index often denoted as nita this characterizes the degree of non linearity and the relationship uh, between the shear stress and shear rate and for nita is equal to 1 the fluid behavior this follows the newtonian flow flow where the shear stress is directly proportional to the shear rate. Now, if nita is less than 1, then the fluid exhibits the shear thinning behavior as the shear rate increases, the fluid's viscosity decreases and resulting the decrease in shear stress and this behavior is commonly observed in many polymer solutions and suspensions. Now, if in another case, then nita is greater than 1, the fluid exhibits a shear thickening behavior. As the shear rate increases, the fluid's viscosity increases and this led to an increase in the shear rate stress and this behavior is less common but can occur in certain colloidal suspension and concentrated emulsions. Let us talk about the elongational viscosity. A material's resistance to deform uh, when subjected to the elongational or stretching force is measured by its elongational viscosity. It measures how a material responds to the extensional flow in which a material is forced in opposite direction and length or stretched as a result. It is especially important in the formation processes where extensional flow takes place such as fiber spinning film, blowing, blow molding and other deformation processes in these the, the deformation occurs. A higher resistance or extensional deformation is indicated by high elongational viscosity whereas simpler stretching or elongation is suggested by low elongational viscosity. So, the Newtonian fluid can be defined the, with these equation where epsilon is the elongation and defined as per the Henke as a natural logarithm of the draw ratio. Now, this is represented as epsilon is equal to ln 1 over uh, L over L naught. Elongation viscosity is independent of elongation rate. This equals shear viscosity and denoted by this particular formula. Nita E is equal to 3 nita. For non-Newtonian fluid, this can be defined as a low as at low deformation rate on um, in, the, in the realm of uh, non-Newtonian flow, it is valid to, for non-Newtonian fluids. The shear viscosity can serve the decimal powers lower than the elongational viscosity. So, any molecular structure affects such a large molecule mass or long chain branching that encourage chain molecule entanglement or impair it increase the elongational viscosity. Effective viscosity, if uh, a fluid is uh, in a, a spatially constant uh, shear field, it assumes a viscosity that corresponds precisely to the sh that shear load. Now, to distinguish it from the Newtonian viscosity, which is constant under all deformation conditions, it is termed as effective viscosity. And this effective viscosity correlates to the uh, particular existing uh, structure of uh, fluid and it is uh, of, of effective viscosity of a fluid is influenced by various factors like temperature, pressure, concentration, molecular weight, additives and the presence of particulates. Apparent viscosity, if there is no spatially constant uh, shear field, uh, mean value is determined from, from the effective viscosities. Now, since the mean viscosity is not actually a characteristic material parameter, it is termed apparent viscosity. And apparent viscosity is specific to the test method and conditions this used for the measurement. And different experimental setups uh, or test geometries uh, can yield different apparent viscosities for the same fluid. Therefore, it is essential to specify the experimental condition and test methods when reporting or comparing apparent viscosity values. So, dear friends, in this particular segment, we discussed uh, different type of uh, conditioning aspects. 
we uh, we discussed about the viscosity we discussed about all the things which are relevant for the testing of the the polymers and for your convenience we listed couple of references for ready reference thank you very much